Welcome to Soul Night Live, episode number 115. Today our guest is Steve Howe. Welcome to Soul Night Live, episode number 115. Today our guest is Steve Howe, and we'll be discussing the two new albums that he's part of right now. Um, so Steve, welcome. So good to have you here today. Right, thank you. So I thought we'd get started and discuss the new Yes album first. Uh, I believe it's the 23rd Yes studio album. Is that right? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not counting. <laughs> well, I love it. You, you know, Yes is a band that just keeps giving, and you have such a vast discography, you know, so there's just so much to dig into and enjoy, you know. And yeah, there is. There is. thank you so much for yet another installment, you know. I, it's always a treat to get to listen to a new Yes album and um, to have another one. It, it was great to dig into this one. And I'm really excited about it. I really like it. Um, mm -hmm. I felt like this one was kind of coming from a different headspace than The Quest. Would you agree with that? I, I guess we were in a nice, we found a nice pattern in The Quest. You know, it's quite an experimental thing with me producing. And, and not that I haven't always had part of the production role in, in Yes and other bands I'm in, I've been in. But, but this was a little different. I think, you know, Yes possibly ben benefited from an experienced overview, which I was kind of give it, able to give. But in the most part, it was just really a practical thing. And, you know, I did have a practical solution to how to make albums, uh, you know, for Yes. And I kind of dreamed it up and it kind of worked. So the quest was one thing. But then to slip into doing the next album uh, was kind of sneaky and, and beautiful because, in fact, we, we didn't sort of down tall and then re-tall. We were sort of like flowing from the edge of uh, the release of the quest into, into this second album. So it was kept us occupied and off the streets and out of the bars and all that stuff and uh, squandering money in casinos and things like that. But basically, we, we, we found something to do. And that, that, that was a follow on from the quest in the same atmosphere, you know, in, under the same conditions. Uh, but they're slightly improved because John Davison came and he's now living most of the time in, in the UK. Jeff did all of his keyboards on this album at, at head, headquarters studio with Curtis Schwartz and myself and not at his own place. But that was just how it all came about. It was better to work, you know, hands on when we could. And of course, Billy and Jay, they did their stuff remotely, but that didn't diminish anything they gave us because they gave us some great stuff. And Billy in particular designed, if you like, how the bass and drums would be as yes ish as possible like he did on the quest but this was another opportunity to show that he could he could take what we'd done and and add a, a, a whole level to it that we we didn't not all of us were thinking about very much but he added to the arrangements and the punctuations and the accents and the sort of like stopping and starting factor that a bass bass and drums can do and he designed a lot of that and uh it, it's to his credit but there again there was a lot of you know all the other textures had to come along and come to life too so it's been very exciting yeah well the buzz on the street so far has been very positive and um people are pretty excited by the first uh two tracks that you released uh and um yeah you know billy's you know really evoking the the classic yes bass sound on this one you know it's the word i think of when i think of yes bass is propulsive and there's a lot of that on this record you know this when it seems a little more upbeat than than the quest would you say that just the conditions of the world at the time affected the tone of the quest versus this new record or no well un undoubtedly in some way but but not in a way that i could possibly be sure to describe but i guess you know it was a a, a diff difficult time for everybody we had to find our feet in in another environment if you like but for us and it was fortunate i upgraded my own private studio in 2019 when I had a outburst and wrote six six titles from you know collected ideas that I'd been um, not been able to get back to but because of the, uh, the 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 time that we gave ourselves which was the second half of 2019 after working touring all the way through the first six months we then had the second six months off to to write and then the deal came along with with Thomas Weber at Inside Out Sony and basically we it couldn't have come at a better time and he's always been very supportive Thomas of yes and he's he's been a great he's he's, he's the most honest person I know you know I mean he says right from the gut and the heart and the mind he says this is what I think you know and so he's he's a very useful member of the team excellent 
Well, it comes out in about two weeks, so I thought we would kind of go track by track and talk a bit about each song that's on there and how it came together. Talk about the guitars you use. Uh, being a guitar player, I'm definitely interested in that angle. Sure. And um, I thought we'd talk a bit about the album cover first and the, and the title. Yeah. Uh, it's another oh, beautiful no. Roger Dean. Yeah, night yeah. sky kind of setting. Am I right? It's kind of like there's a lake and the sky is reflecting in it. That's more or less the gist of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't want, I mean, I don't take any credit for this at all, but the, the basic germ of the idea did start with me. Roger at first said, I don't know, that's something artists have been trying to paint for the years. It's one of the most difficult things to paint the sky with a lake, with the moon and the stars reflecting in it. You know, and it, first of all, he backed away and said, um, I hope he doesn't mind me telling you this or telling the whole world this. But he kind of backed off it. I said, that, that's that's like no. But then somehow the idea haunted him for a bit. And then we chose Mirror to the Sky as the title track. So, you know, he, he got down. And yeah, this is really a very different. Um, I mean, it's Roger Dean without any doubt at all. But it, it, it's it's like almost... Um, kind of re rethought of for this particular album and i think it has a good uh relation to to the music um like roger's work does he heard a lot of this music as it was being created because our headquarters studio near haywood seath isn't far from brighton where well hove or, or no not hove he lives uh, somewhere near brighton uh, i've forgotten what it is right now which part of the local scene, but he was close enough to come up to the studio. So, you know, um, he was a visitor sometimes. So yeah, Roger's work has always been astounding and uh, he, he never fails to come up with something really fresh for us. And and this is great. And of course, Doug and Glenn Gottlieb, who have been, you know, doing Yes programs for years and are, are the photographers generally for, for Yes, do the layout. But uh, Curtis Schwartz, you know, who's our engineer, has got some great cameras, like a Leica and his iPhone. And he took these kind of more intimate pictures. And I particularly love this one. If you can see this one where I'm holding a knife and we're in the kitchen. It, yeah, it's yeah, birthday. I mean, it just shows that, you know, I mean, basically, I think I said this to somebody the other day that I only want to be in things that are real, you know. And a, a group that's real uh, can cope with, all the levels of of imbalance that come at us and we're still stable and i think that's what what, what we've done uh, what i've tried to do from production is to give that stability but also you know to take the time but if you want to kick off with some songs i mean i can't i don't know if i can say much about every song i mean well, it's you know, okay it's quite hot off the presses for me sure but, uh, yeah on cut cut from the stars that's the most different track guitaristically from the rest of the album really because on that i play stratocaster but i use an analog pedal board so it's got this cool multi-pedal on it that, that a lot of people missed and didn't realize how fab it was double wah wah is it auto double wah and so it's got a lot of different settings. And on that, I use um, I use an analog board with a, with an amp. And so it's very undigi, if you like, in the guitar domain, a Stratocaster, admittedly. And this song was written by uh, John and Billy. And um, I I kind of got round to grips with when when the other guys have written a song. I've got sort of an open book, like what's the guitar going to do? I don't ponder that very much. I get a guitar and I get some knowledge of the music and then I sit and play some things, you know, and just find out where, you know, how, how, how I can fit in to, to their plot and, and become part of it. So, but the, the next story is quite different because, um, you know, all connected is a, is a bigger track. It, it's got some grandiose levels. We, we, we move between textures that, you know, are, are definitely rock textures, but they're put in a different sort of order of events. So yeah. you, the sort of sliding steel guitar which which i'm now playing and almost sometimes i look back and don't remember it's a steel you know because it's become so much of my sound so it opens with steel theme and we get this song that has all sorts of interesting quite different guitar approach from me because billy wrote some of the parts that i then replayed with my own sounds mm -hmm. and basically that gave me a head start on the track because he'd already sort of set about some of the moments that that i would recreate so um so it's a very joyful sort of song it's kind of celebrating the fact that you just can't get away from being connected you know to the to the universe and also through that through everybody else yeah. well, what follows is is a highly developed piece of music is luminosity because this piece yeah this took 
some thinking about because we had like version A and then somehow we kind of felt, well, maybe we need a version B. So this this came about, and, and one of the featured things I do on here is play auto half, <laughs> which I, I do. It, yeah. It's on turn of the century. It's on quite a few Yes tracks. It made me I, think I, of that tune, Countryside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Lost in the Countryside. Lost in, lo- yeah, auto half. So I dabble with that. But more importantly, this is, this is a collaboration with the three, um, the three of us, Billy and John and myself. We kind of got this piece sort of like nailed down with, with different ingredients. And they are very different. You know, the song Luminous is, is wonderful. And yet we call it luminosity because we we kind of expanded this idea into a, a a bigger tune. Once again, I move on to steel at the end when the orchestra come back in uh, and start doing a little bit of their their uh, orchestration work, which is really about the first time it well it appears on on the ends of a couple of songs like All Connected and Luminosity. But just to accompany us in, you know, I wouldn't say in the background, but but they're not dominating us. You know, we are, we are holding the fall. Yeah. So, I have a, if I can interject. Jump in. Jump in. question. Um, you played the steel since, I believe, Close to the Edge. I was wondering, prior to that, did you ever play with it on your finger in the traditional sense and then thought, I'd want something fatter so you got the steel instead? Well, I was dabbling with bits of steel, and I did try the bottleneck, but I was always very uncomfortable with that. So um, I guess when I the first guitar I bought in America when I first went on the very first tour in 1971 was a Gibson steel guitar, and I desperately wanted this. And um, it, it does appear on "And You and I." That was really one of my first yes things. I had played a little bit earlier and i'm not sure what the hell it was um on what track but anyway we'll 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 move along from there so it interested me more and more got the pedal steel as well from showbud so i had some pedal steel ideas that i wanted to fulfill but it took a long slow process of it being until going for the one so when that track opens and it's just the steel all the the way through uh, without without any guitar then i suddenly thought well i I've, i've got there you know if i can do that i I can get there. So actually, funny enough, later on when I released my album Motif Volume One on my own label, it's a, a, a collection of solo guitar pieces. There's actually a solo Dobro piece on there called uh, Devon Blue, which I wrote. So I was really over the years just getting so confident on steel. And, um, you know, there's some amazing things about playing a steel if you play it for long enough. Sure. You, you come up to notes. And if you, you know, I used to, sit with the tuner quite quite a lot you know visual tuner so i could see if i was going to hold a note for say two bars or something i wanted to know it was in pitch but my, gradually my ear has, has guided my hands and, and pitching isn't so difficult um but you know it, it's one of the arts you've got to perfect but also what's possible within the street the tuning uh, I think I've gone off the point too much there, but somewhere in there was part of your answer. Yeah, of the answer when you did you acquire the Fender that we've seen you use for so many years? Well, yeah, you see the, the Gibson, which is on the early ones. Um, yeah, what I did was in the 70s, I thought I was going to open a guitar shop. So I had a good working relationship with George Grun down in Nashville, sure. and yeah. one of the top top guitar shops. Amazing and place. Masses of, I mean, I'd buy 20 guitars at once. You know, I went in there because I was going to open a store. Well, what I found was, oh, hold on, they won't let me open the store. So what am I going to do with these guitars? But that steel I bought particularly because Sato and Johnny, you know, he was always playing a Fender. And and, and when I got the Fender, that was it. I, I hardly ever played a Gibson mm-hmm. again. I did on a solo album called Portraits of Bob Dylan. I used a, a really early Charlie Christian pickup mm-hmm. double neck Gibson guitar with the neck separate. They didn't have, they weren't filled in between the necks. So I did use some Gibsons later, but the Fender was what I was looking for. A bit like when I found the Gibson sound was fundamentally my sound until relayer and i went telecaster crazy which i have got on mirror to the sky we'll come on to that in a second yeah but yeah definitely you know that those that 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 side of my work is is you know is, is really interesting well i love it I, you're you're one of my favorite steel players and i like it because you don't have the typical blues cliches that people seem to gravitate towards when they pick up a slide you kind of remind me more of someone like george harrison that just plays beautiful melodies with it yeah I'm interested in that, definitely. Yeah. Okay, um, next up, Living Out Their Dream. This is another peppy little number, uh, kind of the shortest yeah. one on the album. 
and kind of an interesting arrangement. You know, it starts out with something really upbeat, and then you break into this kind of dominant seventh bluesy ending out of nowhere, which is kind of a surprise. Well, that is meant to surprise you because you've had a sort of chaotic rock song with some very kind of traditional, yes, yeah, surprise. I even think it sounds a bit like the Rolling Stones at the beginning. You know, oh, yeah, the people. little, yeah, there's almost like yeah, Keith Richard yeah, chords. Yeah. Those particular movements are, are quite Stone esque. But when you get to that interesting ending, now that does kind of tell the story because because it ends with the line, um, you know, there's no time for a happy ending. So that's sort of like sounds pessimistic, but it's like slightly tongue in cheek because the whole thing is fairly tongue in cheek. Now, everything that's written that I wrote in that song, it actually happened. I mean, it was something I either read about or I was there when it happened. And I, I did go to a steak and seafood bar one, one night on a journey and find there was a wedding going on in the steak and seafood bar. So that's where that line came from, because I noted on tour different things, you know, that I'd seen. They all kind of came together in that song. But as you said, the ending is the twist. It's kind of like it's kind of like not really sour grapes, but it's uh, it's sort of like talking about really how catastrophic you can make your own life. You know, you don't have to. I mean, listen, it's your life. Your life's your life. You can make it anything you want. You can go as low as you want or you can go as high as you want. But somewhere in there, you know, the best thing is to find a stable Zen position in the middle where the fluctuations aren't too great that you go out. But in living out their dream, that's what people were doing. You know, they were living out that fantasy dream that has partly been created by social media. You know, the thing, oh, look, I'm doing this. You know, look, I'm doing that. You know, like an illusion. We don't waste our time doing that. But yeah. they, the people do. What, what guitars are living out their dream? Right, that's a bit more one seven five oriented because okay, the classic, uh, yeah, you know, that that's got a lot of that one seven five on it, and that, that I'm very at home on that, especially when I'm, well, when I do all sorts of things, I can do anything on the one seven five, but sometimes I I'm not going to use that, um, and on, on um, uh, uh, luminosity, there's a kind of a more subtle variety of there's a bits of strat, but there's a lot of steel, but anyway, moving forwards, living out the dream, yeah, quite a lot of that. Uh, that 175. And then we come on to Mirror to the Sky. It opens with the Fender Telecaster. Right. Yeah. The big you know, epic. From Ulaya. Darling, darling, darling. And I play that really all the way through, besides various other guitars like classical guitar, um, you know, some, some other stuff. Uh, I play a lot of 12 string acoustics in the middle with harmonics and things that are going on in a kind of unusual uh, segment oh, we have. It's really, really beautiful. Can you so elaborate have, on the line, dreams of a sky without fire? What, what, what's well, that what that was, for? was, that was a song I, I, I'd i written some time back and it was actually a whole song, you know, that wasn't the song you're hearing. That was like the chorus. And one day I just realized that the, the rest of the song was so strange and stopped and start and it was so kind of highly personal and yet the line you know a sky without fire wasn't it kind of haunted me so i suggested to john that i scrap the song and here's the only bit i want to sing which is you know dreams of a sky without fire so he said no that's great let's just have that so the song went out the window but the chorus stayed and then John eventually wrote the Mirror to the Sky kind of central song, which is has his own, you know, acoustic guitar. And I once again I do single line telecaster in that. And that that arrangement has taken a, it's a very complicated arrangement. Go to a lot of different places in that. And that's what I think keeps us interesting. But very early on, I'd said that we'd taken a bit of MIDI. Uh, from the recording of, of a line um, from acoustic guitar, and we got the MIDI so we could demo an orchestra. And this is when I said to the guys, you know, this could be orchestral, you know, because instead of me just going, duh, 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 they're going to play that. Duh, 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 duh. It's going to be harmonized and all this. So we got the demo from Paul K. Joyce, who is our arranger orchestral stuff and everybody loved it you know i thought it was great so that's where you know that's where again like the quest we we added orchestra except mainly most of the orchestra is on mirror to the sky that that's really where it, we gave it all the space like on the first the first one we did together like this was the quest and dare to know was once again the first time we presented the orchestra uh, in, in a big way and gave them their own space which we do on mirror to the sky but mirror is really good fun because when you think it this must be all over haven't they done this yet and then we come hurtling in after the orchestra get their 16 bars or 24 bars 
where they elaborate on all the beautiful, beautiful things, make the things very beautiful in orchestral sense. And then we come back and say, no, it's not over. We're rocking out. And we kind of rock out with a version of an earlier instrumental section that you don't hear any of the old first parts, you hear new parts. Uh, once again, Telecaster is double tracked and kind of really getting in your face. And then the orchestra through through Paul's arrangement, instead of it being like a drone, there was an awful lot of droning going on in that first instrumental break. You know, it was, de -de -de -bo, de -de -bo, but we had these kind of lines. But this time, you know, we, 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 we've developed the opening line. Do -do 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 -do. We made that a minor minor line and that's what i play and we, double track tellies and then he introduced some chords that i didn't write anyway so the arrangement went hovering into these different chords you know we were in d d then we we're in b flat and and then hang on there's an a flat major seven song so basically i i twiddle around on that and, and found some interesting ways of using that arrangement but it, it's still not over because we end and you think surely and then the orchestra say no no no, no. We just got one more thing to say and they come back again, yeah. just for about eight bars, and it's the wonderful thing. So, Mirror was a was an experiment, you know, a highly experimental track. Most probably the most experimental track we we, we did, and um, you know, it, it, it says a lot about the the way that yes, bigger pieces can be developed, um, and um, it's another example, I guess, of, of that. Yeah, another Yes epic, and it's always nice to have one of those. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was kind of wondering when this lineup was going to get around to one of those, but I think you said in another interview that, you know, epics don't just magically happen. They kind of have to need to happen or yeah, they kind of present have themselves to as such. Yeah, they have to present themselves a little bit, you know, as a temptation to, to find out where, where you right. can take Because it's easy to string 10 things together, but it has to flow logically or there's no point, you know. A lot of that is is hard work. And, and I did a fair bit of that trying out arrangement stuff because Curtis, Curtis Schwartz and I, he's the engineer who's very much behind this record. And he's been a collaborator of mine for 25 years. So basically, we, 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 we've we not yet tired of <laughs> driving each other mad to get to where somewhere we want, you know. And um, basically, we would try out arrangements. And if we are convinced, then we'll let everybody know, you know, we've made an arrangement adjustment and uh, do this accordingly. And um, yeah. so we'll, we'll jump right on to Circles of Time, because here's another totally different story where we're starting the album with the remainder of the tracks from the quest. As I said, we had two 10 minute tracks. One of them was Mirror and the other one was was Luminosity. And and we're John and I are sharing some material, and he said, "Oh, I've got this song. What do you think?" And I went, "Please, let's have this on the album. Don't put it anywhere else. This has to be on the album." So I knew then we had our, if you like, our real. I wouldn't call it a ballad, but I, I our real turn down track. You know, the track that is really mellow, and it never never uses the, the full power of the band. It, it, it relies on the gem, like Wonder Stories did. You know, like sure. a lot of songs we've done. You know, there's tracks where we, we we're not so much a rock band; we're more of a acoustic. And, and yeah. here it is again. So John had a lovely acoustic, uh, you know, work on on his you know his acoustic guitar, strumming the chords with the inversions that he wrote around the song. And then it was very interesting because we did try a lot of things on it, and it, you know, it got weighed down with you know church organs and all sorts of stuff. But in the end, it all had to we all had to get it all off and just find the most minimal. <clears throat> Paul had written, Paul K. Joyce had written a, a very minimal string arrangement, and, and we used some of that. And it, everything was very minimal. Billy does sing on it once, you know, but that, that's the only time it really kind of worked. So, and I played very little on it. Um, it was fun playing. It's in particular, they're interested that it's a nice combination. It's one guitar, but it's recorded in two ways. It's the front pickup of a 175. But it's also the acoustic sound of the 175 at the same time, because oh, okay. after all, it's a full body guitar. It has some acoustic quality. Sure. So he puts those together in a sort of 50, 50 degree acoustic mic on the front and the, and the, you know, the DI guitar going to an amp. So basically uh, that's a, a very subtle sound because it, it's actually multidimensional, but again, there wasn't much to do. John, John was brilliant at doing that, and we had future, future memories on on the quest, which was a similar story. Didn't need a lot doing to it, but what I did do, yeah. So we're we're dabbling with circles of time, and we're still thinking, well, we don't, don't want that. 
something like this. And I, I came back to my own studio and, and I thought, well, you know, the one thing that never interferes with with a chord structure but enhances it is a pedal steel. Because unlike the, the steel I'm usually seeing, like the Fender, you know, that's got no pedals. It can't play chord movements, you know, with inversions. Right. Interesting. It's hard work doing chordal work on it because it's just what well, a chord, you know. Right. But with the pedal, I can I can add the suspensions and the ninths and the sixths and all that kind of stuff while I'm changing chord. So in there, not a lot happens, you know, but when John comes in, circles of time, you know, you've got the pedal steel just about kind of just not interfering but giving that that lovely texture that, that's supposed to be in country music sure. but I, uh, you know since to be over which is really the first place i played pedal steel guitar and a very proud moment that was because all the bit in the middle did you know that that took some working out and uh, it's a marvelous instrument i admire people who play that for a living because yeah. jesus it's demanding you know feet footwork and knee work and pedal work and and string work it's there's a lot to it so you had that on the relayer tour if i remember i remember seeing the footage that was That's like right. one year you took it on the road yeah uh, what i did that to was quite exceptional I, I think i had the steel there all night you know and it was the show bud and it had a fender in front of it i mean that was a colossal manifestation of steel guitars sure. uh, so i've done it in the fairly different way another time i did when we did, here's an interesting thing. When we did going for the one as an album series, uh, I'm sure I went back and had a separate position for the pedal steel. So I went back there and had my my stall and my pedals and all that. So there's a few ways of doing it, or or you know don't 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 even try and and you know comp it on on, on another way. Anyway, let's get back to the plot. Do you want yeah. to do another song? Because um, oh, yeah. we, 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 I guess we have the, the bonus oh. tracks, which I think. Yeah sit really nicely with the album as a whole they don't feel tacked on no they they were worked on in the same intensity as the whole album we didn't know which tracks would be assigned to the bonus disc because we never conceived of a bonus disc before the quest but thomas had a thing about it and we kind of you know played played game if you like played the ball yeah. so basically here we've got unknown you know unknown place which is a pretty big song as well that has similarly to uh living out the dream it has a part where you get to it it could have been over but we we f found another development that we could bring into play to make the song have a kind of two-part ends but there's an awful lot of great organ on this one organ soloing and guitar soloing interchange in two different ways one is a more of a rock style you know do -do 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 -do. you know it's a kind of like almost jazzy vibe but in the end it's more like left to jeff to to be like the church organ in this uh in this other domain you know yeah, which it reminded me more, like a touch of awaken the middle of awaken kind of dropped yeah there is that yeah, yeah. And, an unknown place that that we wanted something mystif mystifying about it as well so some of it is quite straightforward but it's also got a shock beginning you know with the acoustic guitar making you think oh i see and then suddenly you know you get some voices come in and then you get the band like coming in but not not to play rhythm but to play a riff you know so i think it's a nice mix um of arrangement so arrangement is what i think yes listeners don't realize they want but they want you know what i mean they want arrangement that they, they want things to develop and, and that's yeah. what we were so we, we, we want to be surprised you know yeah, like, we, i want to know how it's going to end before it's over you know i want you just don't want the song great about that yeah it's no good if the song just keeps not surprising you know it's right to i mean have it's like this to... is yes yes is full yeah. of surprises you know yeah <laughs> well this, this on that track i mean i list uh you know, a fair bit of acoustic guitars, a 175, the Les Paul Jr. You see, there's a little batch of guitars, a 175, the Les Paul Jr., Strat, Car Telecaster. You know, I can wow. do most of my recordings. I've got to have those, you know, because if I'm doing a back part, you know, like say I'm using a Rockman. I do use a Rockman sometimes. You know, I stick a Telecaster in it. I get one sort of thing that I know, or I put Les Paul Jr. in it, and I get a fatter, you know, tuggy kind of sound. So there's, there's there's sort of things that I like to use, but there again, as I said, the opening track was something totally different with with an analog pedal board, not something I'd usually do over the recent years. 
So there's there's joy in variety. You know what? If you just give me one guitar and one amp, you know, I might get frustrated after a while. I want I want some gizmos. You know, well, you know I liken it to a painter with a box of paints mm. and different colors. You know, mm. that's right. Very much. Well, well, there's two more songs. There's uh, one, one second is enough. And both of these songs are quite kind of sprightly songs. They're not like withdrawn, thoughtful things. They're kind of pushing on songs. And I think that's why they work quite well after Unknown Place is because they've both got their own little personality. One second is enough. You know, it asks the question, um, you know, happiness, you know, it kind of comes and goes. But we don't know why. <laughs> sure. It's, okay. What is that? So basically, uh, I kind of in a in a light sort of way, you know, describe the sort of the, the, the movements anyway, incredibly vaguely. I, w- I will say part of the, the, the job of the lyrics isn't always to be totally clear on what you're on about, but you have to be on about something underneath it, even if it's not really that apparent. Well, and there certainly is that going on in, in that song. Well, the album concludes with, with a, 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 another title that, I think this one kind of was was almost going to be called Too Much Near Another Yes Song, you know, because on the ladder we had a beautiful song called um, It'll Be a Good Day, right? Yeah. And this song was originally called um, It's a Good Day to Be Had by All, you know, and I always thought that's a long time. It's a yeah. good day to be had by another way. Right, it's a good day. It's like the other one. So, in fact, then I realised the hook of the chorus was really that, you know, is love. A magic potion. It could have been love. Is love a magic potion, or is love the? As, that's what I chose. Um, so is magic. Is love the magic potion? And in a way, you know, it hearts back to you know, nineteen sixty-seven when when you know I wasn't really ready to for flower power, you know, but I, I evolved through it from being you know in in the in crowd into being tomorrow, which was a, an official psychedelic band, which I've got a new album released. Yeah. I was, remodeling I was about to bring that up. Um, before we move on, though, I do want to ask you, how did you come up with the baseline for Magic Potion? Right. Well, it's do, great. Do, 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 do. It's yeah, that's so one of the catchy. ones I said, Billy, I do want you to play this. The, the, this, the, this is a baseline that really is the song. You know, I mean, it's got a lot to do with the song. And it's intricate, but but the way you've got to have it balanced is that it's not actually in your face. Going, do, 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 do. But I like the way in the second verses section we we had Jeff playing the the line as well, so we kind of emphasised the the part. But yeah, that's a tricky little bass line. I realised that well, this comes from the fact that most of my music is compiled from small ideas I have. So you know, I get this idea like a couple of chords or a riff or maybe a melody, and basically I, it's gluing them together, which is mostly part of the great fun of making music, isn't? all this stuff and recording it and mastering it and mixing it and really it is that's all beautiful but a very secretive beautiful part is when you're creating it so i come up with that i think you know behind this song da, 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 i said it's kind of easy on the ear but how about if i took that riff and tried it behind it and so yeah i mean it's not totally in character but any kind of busy yes bass riff is in character, you know what I mean? By being yeah. young, I understand. It's almost got a little bit of disco in it somewhere, or maybe it's a well, bit 80s Trevor well, Horn. It's interesting how it changes the whole vibe when you get to the verse. It's almost kind of 70s jazzy kind of, yeah. you know. Almost, what, what almost was like that band? Steely called? Dan or something. <laughs> yeah, and our version, uh, you know, with the great bass player. What was his name? Oh, it's oh, it's Dudley. No, I can't think of it. But there were a lot of great players who, who could 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 add a riff to something that really pepped out. I mean, think about, you know, Two Tribes. You know, that's a sure. great boat that, that, that Trevor wrote, I suppose, or the band wrote, and yeah. various people played, including me, tried to play it and to convince Trevor that, that we could play that riff or he could use that recording of it. And he told me that it's a conglomerate of various performances, actually. Okay. Three different players. But anyway, um, bass riffs are really, oh, you know, I took a track I'm working on, and and I decided I need to rethink it and, and what was wrong with this track. And what was wrong with it was that I'd really conceived it as like a full-time track. But the more I'd sung it and put it and played it and things, it needed this 
you know, it needed to be half time. So I took the bass off and put a new bass on, which was half time. And I've actually got to do nothing else. Just by changing the bass to half time, it's given the whole mood of the track a, 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 a the thing I was looking for, you know, the relaxed bass is just confidently moving as opposed to, you know, giving you the beats in your face because the mood had changed. And I think that that, that happens on Yes quite a lot when Billy designs uh, places that are much vaguer bass wise. You know, I just put a plotted a bass doing the roots, you know, and that isn't enough for Billy quite often. And uh, there are only about three times in the whole album when I requested just simple straight ahead roots, you know, Billy, because sometimes he can, he can marvelously, Com- oh, not over complex, but he can bring complexity to something quite simple, sure. and that's always worth reviewing. But it's not an all the time thing you want, you know. Just like you don't want a guitar ranting in your in your face, always trying to get your attention. Right. It's the same with the bass, but we certainly make sure that the bass is as integral a part of the sound as as everything else. Well, excellent. Well, it's out in about two weeks, folks, so definitely pick up a copy. If you haven't already pre-ordered, this would be a good time to do it. Yes, Mirror to the Sky. Excellent. Um, how much more time do we have? I want to. don't want to... I don't mind. We can go on for... I I'm, okay. I've got a few more questions. Um, some are just kind of random, and other ones are related to the new Tomorrow album. Yeah. But tell me, this was the group that you were in prior to Yes. This is a quintessential psychedelic British group. And I think the Tomorrow album really hangs quite well with the best of the lot, if mm-hmm. not better than a lot of them. And um, I, I was curious, was it like you had the master tapes all these years and you decided to spruce them up and with modern technology, just remixing and kind of EQing it? Or well, how did that come about? It was done something by, uh, uh, well, I like like Charles Martin did with Revolver. He had the luxury of going back to the actual master tapes and doing that. We actually didn't do that at all, uh, partly because we didn't think we could, or if we did, we would get ourselves in deep water. So what we asked for was something that hadn't been available for years, was the mono mixes, the original mono mixes. It took us a year to get those from Warner Brothers, who now own EMI and have the rights. So they kindly uh, did, we did a worldwide distribution deal with them, providing, we, you know, we got the mono tapes. So what we did, we got the mono tapes and we'd found, this is Curtis again, Curtis Schwartz and I, we'd found a lot of, you know, which I don't really like to call them tricks, because they're far more in- interesting than tricks. But there's technology out there now, um, and it's called RX10, it is now RX10. And um, it, 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 the company is called, uh, not Octopus, but um, <laughs> it begins with that, always gets me at it. Anyway, so what this can do, it can take a single track and you can decide what, what, you, what you can take out of that and then put back into it at, at, at an adjusted level or an adjusted pitch or an adjusted timing. So in fact, what you can do is, so yeah i mean look, this is the trick that where it was most emphasized and most rewarding was on the song revolver which had breaks in the music where the tempo didn't match and they put reverb to to make you think it was almost in time so there was a lot of mismatching of te- tempos and speeds so not only could we go into the mono mixes this is because there was a guitar a voice bass and a drum so those four things rx9 or rx10 they, they can separate, they can take them out to degrees. I mean, as long as you're always putting it back in the mix, uh, if you wanted to take something out altogether, you might find it's on other tracks, you know, and therefore you can't. It's but weird. for the most part, we could achieve everything we wanted to. So I did a list, a whole one page list that listed all the songs we'd, we'd accumulated in anticipation uh, that we'd requested the mono mixes of. And we could then fix stuff that was unthinkable to fix even five years ago. Even, you know, certainly 55 years ago, there was no way to make the album better. So I took three tracks off that I think were inferior stylistically. And they were good songs, but they weren't our style of songs. It wasn't a band, you know, psyching, psyching out the flower power. So basically, I found other tracks that were hidden, you know, and some some uh, studio releases that hadn't been put together. So basically what well, I put together all the best of that, that music that we, that we could find and treated it with the RX-10 situation, which, which is an amazing technology. So it means that, for instance, we can take a, a vocal off and um, we can decide 
in which way we might be able to, well, the vocals are, I won't mention the vocals. Let's take the guitar. You know, I've got a guitar. It's a bit too loud. You know, it comes in and goes, splats you, and you think, oh, that's spoiled. it. We can take that back, you know, and, and if the bass is uh, a little bit out of pitch or out of time, you know, we can adjust that. But what we weren't doing was actually physically remixing it. We didn't have faders. Right. And stuff. Yeah. We had little ways of altering stuff as it went along. <clears throat> and the way, you know, we did that a lot. I mean, <laughs> although it was planned to do in a day, it took a day fundamentally to map through all the songs and find out how many of the problems we could fix in one day. But it took several other days to to actually create all the, 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 the level of perfectionism we'd hoped to do. So it's not remixed, it's reimagined, you know, and by me, and also remastered in the sense that it's, uh, you know, it's had some treatment and reordering. And it doesn't really hurt. But it's got, you know, a lovely sleeve and, you know, we've given it a sort of ability and it's now called Permanent Dream. So that separates it from the original album, which was just called Tomorrow. And um, so we've, yeah, I rethought the order and got a chance to have two or three quite wild guitar improvisations, but not together. You know, I mean, the timing of them is crucial. I think you could get Y first after about five tracks then you get another one further on i, so, I, I love not, why i think that might be my favorite track can you tell me a little bit about that one well we love the birds you know i mean their vocal sound and and uh, roger mcguinn's eight miles high that was that was a uh, really very very inventive very very inventive group and they like yes they had a, a long history and of course they ended up with the, the, the sweethearts of the rodeo which is which is a great birds album it's, it's different from you know uh the earlier the, the, the notorious birds brothers but 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 in the earlier era era of course they were juggling with uh with psychedelic music and we love i don't know what it was about white well it was partly that jim McGuinn, he started that da 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 ding da 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 ding, which I play again, but I I take that to another extreme maybe, and and treat that as a basis to jump off for a for a fairly uh, big improvisation. And uh, those were something we hardly ever talked about. We just did it, you know. Yeah. We. We, we, we got to a point in the song and, you know, I could rattle around for as, for as long or as for short as I liked. And if it was happening, it was long. And if it wasn't happening, it was short. <laughs> sure. Well, every night's different and, uh, you know, it yeah. just depends on the mood and where it takes you. Yeah. I had heard you mention in another interview that you opened for a number of seminal acts back in the day, including The Who. Can you share any memories of... I, you said you guys were almost kind of scared of them, that they were kind of just this wild, untamed bunch well, there's a few things that happened in Red Hill. Now, Red Hill is a town of, between London and Brighton, and, and, and it's in the middle there. And it was almost like a no man's land, you know, as far as if you were London and you went there, you thought, well, this could be trouble. You know, bikers, rockers, mods. You know, there was it was an aggressive place. Now, I don't know. I think I've got the two visits to Red Hill that kind of like almost got a similarity. One was when we opened for The Who. And all we remember was that they, I think we saw Pete going up the road past our van in a Rolls Royce or something, you know, um, you know, we were on our way and, the, you know, there was Pete kind of thing. So we knew this band were like, you know, they were big time, you know, they had the dosh, they had the hits, you know, they were the who. So I guess we were... Um, bit on our toes you know we we, we weren't that comfortable uh and after the show i think they did a fair bit of trashing up you know i think keith came off at red hill and and battered the dressing room considerably but <laughs> let's say about another time we played there which was that we were scared shitless because we were going to get beaten up by a bunch of these guys and we hid in the van after the show, we heard these guys looking for us. We actually hid in the van. But but the 60s were very unpredictable. You know, th this was pre-Flower flower Power when the, the place was supposed to, you know, be filled with the hearts of loving people. Uh, but before that, it was like, you know, you know, they didn't like, see we were a bit of a mod group before the, the tomorrow became tomorrow. We were the Inca and we were kind of mods. And it's like, we love you afterwards. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous talking about this now because it's so out of sync, you know, with with the, the world I know. But maybe in another level, it, it, it depicts the, the sort of unnecessary violence that keeps going on around the world, irrespective of how many live aids we have or how many hunger 
cries we have or how many urgent problems the world's got. They, they just never seem to be substantially repaired, fixed. No. People. Invested, solved, healed. He, that's what the world needs: is massive healing. And boy, it's it's it, 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 you know it's not there yet. You know, well, great music helps get us a little closer to that goal. Oh, I think. Definitely keeps me and, and you and us going. Another quick question for you: um, the Les Paul, the one you used during the Tormato era. Yeah. I saw a video recently, I, I guess you had uh, let it go at one time and somebody mm -hmm. else owns it. What inspired you to let it go? Well, really, I key, one key thing was that I couldn't play it. It was so heavy. Oh, it I bet. Was, and at that time, I was very sensitive because I hadn't realized that when I go running about the stage and going, you know, like crackers, of course, I, I, there's a price to pay for that. Sure. So the heavier the guitar, the worse it was. I remember Dave Stewart once calling me up and saying, what's the lightest guitar you can play? Because I've hurt my back and I've got a show and I don't know what to play. And I said, Telecaster, you know, with no no, no additions. The Telecaster, the middle of, but like the Les Paul, yeah, what a sound that guitar had. If only I could have seen the value of keeping it, you know, but that's the same any guitar you part with. There's always one idea you might have, why you might have kept it. Right. But in a way, um, yeah, I wanted a more practical, and I've got one. It's the Les Paul Roland. That the I red have. one you have, right? The red one. Yeah. That guitar's beautiful. And partly beautiful because I played it a lot, and I played it on stage many, many tours. Done a lot of recording. In fact, the opening to the Ice the ice bridge is played on that guitar so it really is a great les paul for me so having a, a gorgeous very very decorative and, and but really the weight it was really if you if you ever see one and get the chance lift it up and you'll go i think right. i know what it could have been made with rock right and a regular rock, less rock, is rock. probably 12 pounds anyway that's one of the lighter ones you know so this yeah. is like 15 or something you know it's really yeah. beautiful though i mean there were very few of those made did gibson approach you when it was new and say hey steve would you like this or i, I did go to gibson a lot you know in kalamazoo they, they used to book shows in kalamazoo particularly because they knew i was going to say why aren't we going to kalamazoo so in the 70s, yeah, it, 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 it came out. It was a model that fascinated me uh, when I heard about it, you know, that it was all wood, you know, the scratch board, the, the knobs, everything was yeah. good, uh, which had a weight effect. And also it had one of the reasons I didn't, one of the things I didn't realize was those machine heads I had on it, uh, which were like super grovers. They were actually square. The, mm -hmm. the, the giant things. I mean, they weigh an absolute ton. You know, I mean, I take them off guitars now because I don't want the neck going down like that. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, as lovely as all the guitars I've owned, they've all been exciting when I bought them. You know what I mean? I didn't buy guitars that I wasn't excited about. But but if I had it 30 years and I hadn't used it a lot, I'd start to ask the question, well, that's not really doing much for me. Um, but that guitar did, and it was highly featured on going for the one. And uh, it was a truly great guitar. It may even been on uh, Machine Messiah. Yeah, I think well. it is. And a lot of Tormato as well. Yeah, kind yeah, of. But now I've got the ES Artist, which was my original Asia Live guitar. Yeah. But that developed, and that's on uh, that's on Mirror to the Sky quite a bit on the album, because um, that got renovated by Tim Stark at, at Manson Guitars. Basically, when it came back, it was just singing. You know, the whole guitar had been set up right. We got rid of an issue we had with some deteriorating gold that kept going green lo and behold mm -hmm. and it was the case so basically we got the guitar going and i've been recording on it a great deal and many of the tracks we've talked about have moments like particularly um a, a, a magic potion and um well one one second is enough features the steinberger 12 string i should okay said. yeah because da -da -dun, da -da -dun, da -da. that's a very that's a very call upable sound that i i make it's on a lot of new age records i did in, in the uh, late 90s 2000 where it's a clean very sprightly sound and i thought that was a good move doing a different sound and also it starts with a an organ introduction you know because i said i'm not going to open every song on the album come on you got to play this so you know we find ways of, of getting the balance but certainly with guitar textures that's one thing that pleases me about albums i make when i can hear going through the different textural things and and i enjoy that uh that that rightness about the sound yeah uh, here's another question totally unrelated um yeah. 
I noticed Jeff hasn't contributed a whole lot to these three Yes albums compared to some of the other writers in the band. Is that a conscious decision or is there a fear that it may sound like Asia if he writes too much or? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've touched on a few points, but, but no, it's really about what people have got. And when we did the quest, Jeff, Jeff was quite forthcoming, had quite a lot of things in the most part, you, you know, he had the tracks, the ice bridge and also the, the basic shape, I mean, it was a big shape, but it changed right. of, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, a living dream. Uh, what's it called? Um, um, living Island? A living, yeah, a living island. So yeah. basically, you know, he, he had his foot, his foot in the door pretty big that time. But this time there wasn't so much. Okay. And, you know, I, I worked out some things on uh, Living Out Their Dream that were, were were using some of Jeff's theme, a tune that he had for for a, that I used for the verses was actually written by Jeff, the tune. So basically, it's it's what you've got, you know, what's available. We didn't pressurise him and say, why haven't you got anything? We right. just kind of kept accumulating our stuff and waiting to see what we could do with Jeff. So maybe on the next album, you know, he'll be more forthcoming. There's no there's no really pattern behind it. And, you know, I I I don't know what one should expect. You know, I mean, I don't think one should expect, but but it's nice um, that we have found a level of balance as good as we have it at the moment of of the the, the, the main songwriters. Sure. But if Jeff what comes through more on the next album, that'll be great. Yeah, that's great. Well, we always enjoy hearing his writing, but yeah. we enjoy yours just as much. So you know, I understand. It's not like the album has to be divvied up evenly between everyone no, no. in the band when it comes one to writing. Can't really create one. Can't really create that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Is there any activity coming from the Steve Howe trio? I understand you're working on a new album. Is there no, any truth to no, that? No. No, no, I mean, Dylan and I have been collaborating, you know, on, on mostly my records and, and those three trio albums uh, since 1993. So he's a big part of my output outside of the band. And um, after we did the album, um, you know, um, Direction, New, new Direction, was that what it was called? New Frontiers. Yeah, it was called New Frontiers. So basically, um, no, that was it. I mean, really, Ross moved away in, musically from us and, and got on with some great work that he wants to do. <clears throat> and similarly, Dylan <clears throat> dabbled with things, and then he was working with Wilco Johnson um, for, for many years before he passed away. So basically, Dylan, uh, Dylan and I, you know, we don't really see that. Um, it was great that we took the opportunity to do as much work as we did. And to do those three albums was was considerable commitment to it. And the tours we did, and also in Canada, we did um, some nice touring and a little in Europe. But most of it was done in the UK. So we love that band. But, you know, like like I said about the reality of a band, it has to be real. And, and we lost that with the trio. We, partly because Ross was off and I was off one time, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I was so busy that I, that I could hardly get into doing solo albums and uh, outside projects. But I, in the 2012, I left the reunion of Asia because because that was evident to me that I couldn't keep up being in two bands and the trio and my solo album. So something had to give, and um, I guess the trios. Uh, had to give in that way. Um, there was some interesting filming, a little bit on the internet, but of a show we did um, in, in um, I think it might have been Southport or somewhere like that. So the, maybe there's a, a re, uh, reassessment of that band should be should be done. In fact, there's an alternative mix of the whole album of the last one that uh, was was quite different, quite a different mixing style. So maybe there's a little to show of, of how the band has evolved through uh, maybe a, a collection or something. A club, okay. Uh, All right. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difficulties Yes has had lately with touring? I know the European dates were kind of pushed back. Mm -hmm. as well, not really, because, you know, in some ways things are beyond my, in my control, <laughs> you know, like they're beyond everybody's control at times. And basically, you know, to, to, to dissect why would be like asking a very big question, because, you know, there's never one single reason. But certainly the one that's been cited publicly more is the insurance problem. But I don't see that that's going to change next year. But there is confidence. When you've got confidence, then you can move forward a lot better. And when you look at Europe at the moment, uh, with that just awful, awful business with uh, Russia and Ukraine, yeah. uh, 
you know, it's so tragic. But that's if that if if that wasn't bad enough, you've got all the other outbursts of demonstrations in France and and trouble. I mean, was Italy has been quite quiet recently, but you know, then you get the earthquakes, you know, in Turkey and things. So we were going to be touring a lot of places that were bordering closer to a lot of the great troubles, not only you know, violence, but also you know, geographical, nat natural risks. Yeah. You know? So in a way, um, there was a lot of reasons why. And we've kind of just stalled that idea, booked ourselves another European tour uh, for next year. And uh, but mainly is a little bit more Western Europe and the UK. And we're really excited to do that because we've got the Albert Hall to finish it off. Oh, but in the meantime, of course, we, we haven't announced it yet, I don't, I don't think, but we are going to be venturing into the States this year. And, yeah, I heard there's going to be a, yeah. a, at least one leg. I hope maybe more. I'd love to see you down here in Atlanta again. It's been a little while. Well, we'll try and cover the terrain, is, is what we usually do. But last tour, we did a East-West-East -East tour, and, and that demands a lot of traveling. So this time we're doing an East-West tour. So hopefully we can take in, you know, the, the bits of Florida and, and the, the bits of everywhere else that's, that's on, you know, make, make places en route because, you know, we've got great demand. We've had great offers to play. So we'll be selecting what we can actually do in a given time frame, which, which isn't as many as people might like us to do. But, you know, we, we are very realistic. You see, we don't take on things that, you know, are going to be. Because after six weeks of touring or, or seven weekends, things start happen in, in a band, you know, you start to want it to stop. You know? A cabin <laughs> fever. Yeah, I mean, yeah, cabin <laughs> fever. And yeah, also yeah. Re repetition and also kind of a hunger for just to settle down somewhere. Sure. <laughs> totally so, of course, we're, 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 we are big tourers, you know, none of us dislike touring in any way at all, but, but only because the show is worth doing, you know. So the rest of it is grappling with with greater difficulties you know I, I, I there's you know leaving to go to japan and and going to japan was was as difficult as going to america you know i was taken to second immigration and all, all because my visa was there but it wasn't printed in my in my passport it was on the computer in in, in the, so i mean i had all sorts of problems but i can only say that traveling and you know, accommodating movement does get harder the more you've done. But I usually just resign myself to it. I say, okay, I've got, I know how long this is going to be. I know some of the stuff that's going to come at me doing that. So just get your head down and get on with it and find the pleasure in the show as much as you can. That, that's, that's the real reward, you know, the pleasure in the show. What do you do with your downtime on the road? Do you have any special <laughs> hobbies or activities? Well, it's about travel, usually making the travel work. Uh, if we happen to be in somewhere for a while, I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll dabble in things, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, anything to do with the First Nation American, you know, there's a nice museum in Denver or something or down in uh, Phoenix, you know, I'll go. And then other places I go to guitar shop like Cincinnati. Cincinnati's got quite a lot to offer in guitar shops, Gary's Guitars, and also some great clothes shops I found opposite the hotel. So, you know, so veggie restaurants, you know, but it's not really about being a tourist at any point at all. You know, I, I've been there, seen it, done it, bought the program and the T-shirt, and I'm back. So <laughs> there, there, there's a sense of accommodation and having my own space. I guess the most important thing is, yeah, I usually travel by car and, and I have my own space. And, and that's what keeps me sane. I, I'm not sure I could go any other way. And the, the guys have seen that sometimes I'm even there before them <laughs> when they've taken two flights. So basically there is um, there are ways of accommodating it, but it takes immense patience and it, it's a sacrifice. You know, it's always been a sacrifice. Most probably people don't realise how much of a sacrifice. Sure. But we did that because, you know, the art calls us. You know, if it wasn't calling, I wouldn't be there. So it's calling. And I've always followed my music, uh, my musical I don't know, just I follow my music, you know, that, that's as simple as it. Do you think you're going to work in some tracks from the new album into the live set? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. 
Actually, no, I hope you can play the. I hope you can play the title track. That would be pretty compelling. Well, we haven't decided, but but we're allotting time for that. Yeah, and, that's a long uh, one, yeah. Yeah, well, we know we're we're not going to be playing Relay. Although we've advertised that for three or four years, <laughs> that's partly why we're not going to be playing it. We're 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 just like we're, we're kind of overcooked on that idea mentally. We kept getting ready, and so now we 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 feel like we've got a new uh, plateau to be on. Hey, we can do what the hell we like. Let's do something really great. And of course, you know, having some new music w- would invigorate us as well. Um, and picking the tunes we really do want to play from the past is, is also nothing but pleasure. So, well, Was there yeah. ever a time when you all got together and played Side 2 of Relayer live, thinking you were going to play it out soon? No, only in the 70s did we do that, you know, and when okay. we were playing Side 2, yeah. yeah. After that, both those songs were absolutely hushed, you know, except for me doing a solo acoustic guitar version of to be over uh just to, to just to kind of keep my finger in it a bit right but no, that that that's uh those recordings are are yeah they're they're, they're very bold you know well sound chase is very bold oh, and yeah. then it's got got some of the, the the sort of like relaxedness that that yes we're we're you know finding you know in in its maturity yeah a very sublime track you know and you know and that's Kind of, you know, different sides of the yes equation, you know, and the perfect album kind of has all these things, you know, the rocking things and the kind of beautiful, sublime, textural things. We hope so. Yeah, that that's that they are the 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 ingredients we need. Yeah, and this new one's got that going on too. So, just one more quick question before we go. Um, we're missing Alan a lot, and I was wondering if you could just share a, a random Alan story that makes you smile all these years later that maybe nobody's heard. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, to spot a couple, you know, of course, in the, in the seventies, we were actually partners in a health food shop in Hampstead in London for a while. It, it turned out to be a bit of a, a money drain because it wasn't really making money. So we had a, another experience. Besides being in Yes together, we were also owners of a health store. So that was quite good fun. But then he knocked us sideways, really, when we got to drama and, and Trevor and Jeff joined. And we did the drama album. I mean, really, his drumming there was was some of the most incredible stuff he'd done to date. You know, oh, absolutely, and it, one of the best recordings too. It just is captured so beautifully on that record. That had such a. Funny enough, I went off and did all the guitars myself on my own, and went back, and everybody said, "God, these are bright." And I went, "Well, it's a guitar, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's right." And then we got the keyboards, and we did that album, and the teamwork between. Uh, Hugh Padgham, you know, Trevor Horn, um, you know, the band, myself wanting to say what things could be like, you know, and we came up with that because Eddie did an interim period. He did the first three weeks uh, or the first two weeks when we were doing the backing tracks. But unfortunately, the relationship didn't didn't manifest into being a solid, you know, way of going forward. So from then on, we took it on ourselves. And Trevor wasn't like, you know, I'm the producer. He never did that once. He stayed exactly as he was. We all did. We just all collaborated on on the uh, the arrangements and the production and the mixing, you know. So uh, we had some great people, you know, mixing drama with us, Gary Langham and uh, Julian Mendelssohn. And all these guys were in the studio. So it was a very interesting period. But, of course, then Alan just became the, the 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 lifelong drama you know lifelong yes drama right the way through when i wasn't there in the 80s and then union and then then from keys to ascension when i did rejoin and stay so basically he was plowing on and i knew he'd never give up i mean this guy was not going to say actually i'm not coming <laughs> that, that was it he'd come by hook or by crook whatever he could do you know and he, his commitment to yes was was unbelievable it was unbelievable so yes. we love his memory and we dedicate mirror to him oh being excellent a great idea there's a picture floating around on the internet of the two of you back in the 70s in las vegas have you seen that recently in front of like the golden nugget or something uh, is it like two two figures behind the golden nugget sign yeah it? yeah like the two of you just out in the street i'm guessing you guys probably played there in 77 and just went downtown to look around a bit and <laughs> we were more curious then because las vegas had that unusual thing i guess we didn't go to the west coast till 72 so we had a, a year or so when we wondered what's the west coast like you know of course we got there and and sort of fell in love with it yeah you know, as you can't help them do at first and then 
then, you know, then it became like a, obvious. This was a sort of party town. Well, LA particularly was your right. party town. And um, so, yeah. So what was your question again? Oh, I'm just curious if you had any memories of that first trek. I, I think yeah. Billy saw you guys at like the Sahara or one of those places and like yeah. going for the one tour, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you definitely, but, but we never. We I tell you what was different about it, and why when you when you say can you remember the Vegas shows? It was like at first, no, I don't remember the early casinos, but we did play them. But also we played the halls in the town, you know, the real town, mm -hmm. and uh, that was good. That was always good. At first, when we went into casinos, it was a bit like it's a bit kind of icy cold out there, you know. Like, yeah. The air conditioning is oh, and yeah. kind of like you know, it's a bit aware but we got used to that we got used to being able to pull off shows in casinos because it's a captive audience and some of them wanted to come and see you and some of them didn't have anything better to do so they came and saw you but at least you had the opportunity to turn them on and uh yeah i mean they they were pretty good show. i'll tell you what we liked we started to like was the quality of the facilities i mean this is another side of it you know what i mean sure <laughs> i mean you play an old theater like the beacon in philadelphia or something you know no, the beacons in new york uh whatever it is you play these old theaters and, and sometimes you've got to crawl up three pairs of stairs to a dressing room that hasn't been renovated for 50 years you know right and you go in a casino and it's like well, as i said too much air conditioning right. you know sometimes if you've got a good dressing room it was like a suite you know you had a bathroom uh an annex a dressing room you know you had a i mean why <laughs> i'm only right. here to i'm out of here i used to say why stay in the hotel why not just stay here I mean, sure, right, exactly. right. <laughs> so it, it was, it, there are things to appreciate and you must never forget when you're lucky, you know, mm -hmm. that you sort of appreciate it then because the next gig, I mean, we did some Asia when the reunion, we did some casinos up in high, up in Northern Michigan, which, uh, you know, were like, we'd call them kind of kitsch or off the wall. You know, they, they were casinos, a little bit small, a little bit kind of crampy, a little bit nerdy, you know, in the sense that that uh, you know the clientele was w wasn't your Vegas clientele or even your Reno, and now we're starting to oh, no. head down the down the chart of of the kind of folk that like like to go to a casino. Well, and sometimes I just see these little old ladies sitting on a stool, hucking dollar coin after dollar, and I just think, how did you wind up? How did your life lead you here? <laughs> well, especially if it's eight in the morning and you've come down from breakfast, right. and they're still there. She's it's like what ahead. happened to these poor people <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's a vice it's a it, i mean they keep trying to find reasons why we should call alcoholism and and uh, gambling a sort of a, like a disease or you know it's something you fall into it's a trap you know yeah. and if you fall into it you sink <laughs> yeah yeah well or you yeah. get broke really quick i imagine most of those people lost more than they won but they keep yeah. trying so maybe there's something to that stick to it to That's inspire right. us all. Determination. <laughs> yeah. So last question, I was curious, anything left in the archives? You know, a lot of groups say King Crimson, you know, he's released every utterance that the band ever recorded in these lavish box sets. And I just think it'd be cool if Res Yes could just release one good live show of every tour in the 70s. Do you think there's even enough stuff around to make that happen? Well, Progeny was a version of that. You yeah, know? that that kind of wet my appetite. It's like now I want relayer. Now I want a going for the one. You know. Yeah. Well, I believe me. Um, the Warner Brothers would be are very interested in that kind of an idea. I thought I had one for them once when I had six dat tapes. You know, those little dat tapes, six six concerts from Union uh, on, on six dats, and I said, well, look, there's six from Union, but. Um, but that didn't that didn't go that didn't run, uh, and I think that, um, um, in other words, while you're thinking about going forwards, you can only exert so much time to going back and looking, right. like I did with tomorrow. I mean, I exerted some time now. I said, "This is this is a mess. This is this could be better," and I got it done. Uh, but but when you get into the era era of yes, yeah, I mean, we, if we find some stuff. I wouldn't necessarily have to oversee. I mean, I could I could approve the mixing, but you know, as far as all live stuff, you see, Yes songs was totally unique. It, we mixed that like it was a studio album. We spent months on it, and then after that, we really never did that again. Although Chris mixed Yes shows with Eddie uh, down in the studio, that was done quicker too, much quicker. 
And then I wash my hands with mixing live and, and we just need to find people who are good at mixing live sound because, you know, it's, it's much too much work. If you do, if you get a good engineer that, that they can pull that together. Yeah. It, they know the music to someone. Yeah. So um, live music is a, is an endless source of, of another, another version providing, I mean, there's all sorts of tapes that yes, did lose, you know, uh, there was some Philadelphia filming where they filmed the show from above and everything. And uh, piecing it together is difficult. But yeah, if there was more found, it would happen. It would come about. And uh, Warner Brothers might even be thinking more about that now than they were before, because there is mileage in, you know, progeny was a good idea. And uh, as you say, there would be other takers. Oh, sure. I just want the whole collection. I want the whole... <laughs> The whole nine yards. All the way up to drama, all those. Yeah. It, do you have any idea why Drama Tour was never officially recorded? By, I mean, there is no live footage at all, except for, you know, the stuff where you lip synced in the studio and did Into the Lens and Tempest Fugit. Well, on Yes Live, we did a Yes Live box set, didn't we? Because there is. Yeah, the, yeah in a word or. I can't go remember through this. In a word. Yeah. No, we'll, we'll go through this. And I thought Fly from here were both on there or maybe their private recordings haven't been released but i thought they were released on yes live it was part of the rhino projects we yeah. were doing um but yeah why it wasn't yeah. yeah that's a lack of insight at the moment you know when you when you well we were grappling with holding all the drama together it was you know like the title suggests it was quite traumatic but basically none of us had the insight to think you know, beyond that. So why don't we capture this so that we can see this later? There was just none of that, as far as I know. Uh, yeah. It might have been suggested and canned, or it may have been shot with two cameras and canned. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Something could have happened, but but the, the evidence is is that really there isn't really anything much that, that, that has resurfaced. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I really can't think why, because... Uh, it was a hell of a tour. It was a yeah, hell of a tour. Yeah, I'd just love to see it. I've seen pictures, and it looks really compelling. Um, yeah. So I think maybe it'll surface someday. I've seen a lot of people pop up with Super mm -hmm. 8 silent footage yes. from Tormato, and then they dub the live track on it and sync yeah. it, which must be a monstrous job trying to figure out well, somebody did silent that with footage. Be somebody did that with To Be Over, and they reckon they put that sound there themselves. I, I don't know how that can be true because the syncing is fine all the time and yet what you'd expect if it was a different night that that somewhere the syncing just couldn't be the yeah, same it couldn't be quite the same and that... no, i don't know how they've done it they've either done it very meticulously or they didn't yeah. uh and that guitar's that loud because it was that loud or you know the vocals of this whatever they were but yeah i mean that show that that is up there uh i mean i'm not trying to lead people to watch it necessarily but you can't avoid it uh, a, a version of to be over is it, amazing how we managed to play that i mean chris and i are singing virtually all the time with john you know there's massive complex harmonies going on and i'm standing there with these brutal looking steel guitars two of yeah. them right in front of my face all the time. And somehow I'm still having a lot of fun. And that was our, uh, that one, the, the opening act was Seals and Crofts on that show. Okay. And Summer we Breeze. Them because we liked Seals and Crofts. We thought they were really cool, you know. So if we could have an act, we'd like somebody who was classy and they were definitely classy. Yeah. So, well, but I think it rained, so it didn't turn out to be that classy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little, little um, soggy. <laughs> yeah. Well, Steve, is there anything you'd like to share before we wrap it up with our, our viewers? I, I don't know. <laughs> We've discussed a lot. Yeah. I can't think of what, what I could add. Only that, uh, what have I got on top of my head? No, yeah, we're looking forward to getting back and, and doing live shows because at the moment we're kind of, you know, got a, a hiatus really from recording and we're waiting to let the juices flow naturally um, if we do any more work. So with live is very much on our mind. You know, we're working out the set and there'll be a lot of touring and throwing and a lot of homework will be need to be done because we, we don't like to really rehearse together for longer than six, six or seven days, just because it, that in itself gets tiring. And then you've got a tour. So we, we've got to come well prepared. And that's usually what we do. When you're prepping and learning a piece of music that you haven't played in decades, yeah. like when you like when you did Masterworks and you relearned Gates, how quickly did that come back to you? I mean, was a lot of it kind of like sometimes your hands remember quicker than your brain does? 
I can tell you that much to my delight, even when I think, God, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't played this for years. When I get there, if I was part of the writing and the initial recordings, I, I will find a lot of it. A lot of it will actually come back. I've even said to somebody, I think I can play any Yes song in part that I've ever been part of, because I most probably can. But but where the fun gets and where the hard work is, 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 is in what I call the detail, obviously. So, yeah, you know... Da, 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 da. you know you know parts of the song and they're easy and you can stroll along but when you get the the differences between certain returns like like gates is particularly a good example you've got that da, 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 da. well there's two of them and to my ear i can't even tell which one it is you know but when i play it i have to know which one it is whether it's the one starting like this or it's the one that actually starts like this so there's two of those and that that keeps you on your toes a lot, but most of it has got to be memorized. And it's got to be in your memory. It's in your DNA memory because it, it kind of is. Um, that's what helps me. The, the break in that is if I play something, if I try to play something from Tomato, I most probably wouldn't wouldn't have a chance of knowing what the hell's going on. Partly because it's one of the least played albums, except for Onward. We did magical a little and, and don't kill the whale sometimes. Yeah. But I would say that a lot of the other albums have got tracks that we played loads of times. So, but recalling it is is down to having the CD and the handset and your guitar and you say, like, what is this? It's actually just absolute graph. It's absolute graph. You've got to spot notes. Sometimes I can get things. I've got certain versions of going for the one. I've got a special version of going for the one where I'm, the other band members aren't even there, really. Right. It's just the guitar. So I can feature on the guitar. We did those as work tapes. And we used to do that in the early days. But now it's a question of putting it on and, and hoping that I can hear the guitar well enough to discern what it is. I mean, I had to do that with, like, when we were playing the Ice Bridge, for instance. You know, that guitar part doesn't sound that complicated, but to remember it was very, very difficult because it was actually quite spasmodic and it returned to certain things, a bit like a bark beast does. It returned to certain things, but not quite the same. So there was a lot to learn and compress into creating memory. And the most important key for that was the vocal. So when the vocal hit something, I'd kind of, okay, well, I think it's I've got to do this. And the vocal hit something else. It must be that. And that was kind of guiding me. But when you go back to the early, yes, intricate, yes, uh, 70s, particularly with Rilea, which, as I say, we're not playing at the moment, was, well, 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 you know, soon is, 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 is a separate entity, really, which we love. But but those twiddly bits really, yeah. I mean, particularly in the battle scene, da 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 uh, when it, when I go, those that is a lot of complexity. I love it. You know, I mean, yeah. I wrote the stuff. I wrote the guitar part, so I ought to be able to play it. And if I can't, then I'm not sure anybody else could. You know, but I, I could be the best person to play. But it does recall. There is recall going on and notes. I make a new chart. Well, not always new, but uh, you know, I've got charts of how the chords look or what the parts are called. That guides me a lot. I mean, if I've already got a chart. I'm halfway there, but if I've got to make one, then I'm 100% not there yet. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm part of a collective that does a musical tribute show with a different theme each month. And we did one about British bands last summer, and I actually got a group together, and we did uh, Don't Kill the Whale, Wondrous Stories, Time and a Word, Astral Traveler. Well, wow, And, um, <laughs> and uh, what other one? What other one was it? Um, I guess time in the word was the one. Yeah. So mm. I really enjoyed learning a lot of your licks off of, of the, the Tormato track in particular. There's just a lot of those are so unique. And, uh, you know, they're quite bluesy. I mean, that's quite bluesy. Yeah. I mean, it happened again on that song on drum. I want my phone's ringing. Okay. I might have to go. Okay. Yeah. We should probably wrap it up. I don't want to keep you any longer. Oh, yeah. Hi, Steph. Great. Want to chat? Yeah. I'm fine. I'm just going to say goodbye to somebody on Skype. That will take 10, 10 seconds. All right. We're over. We just finished. You called it at the perfect time. Okay. Hold on. All right, then. Lovely to chat. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for everything, brother. Steve. Your music yeah. has made my life so much better. Thank you. Right. For, and I look forward to more. Take care. We'll see. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Take it easy. Bye.